You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, I'm Kate Endel, and I make art for a living. Kate Endel has been an illustrator since the age of one, and her parents have the drawings to prove it. After college, she pulled up stops for the Pacific Northwest and focused on creating for children. She's gone on to make her own brand of cards, puzzles, books, and decor, and work with clients like Hallmark, Sesame Street Workshop, and beloved children's entertainer Casper Baby Pants. Here's my chat with Kate Endel. Who are you and what do you make for a living? Uh, my name is Kate Endel, and I'm a freelance illustrator. I've been illustrating professionally for about 25 years, and I, my specialty is children's books, writing and illustrating children's books. And then I license those images to home decor and paper products. And then I also create um, original one-of-a-kind pieces of art and prints that I sell in various platforms like Pike Place Market in downtown Seattle and craft shows around the Pacific Northwest where I live. And I guess that's the short-ish answer. (laughs) Well, we're going to get into the longish answer, which is, I'd like to know, how how did you get started? What what started you off in illustration? Well, I mean, I've really been drawing since I was about a year and a half old. So, and I have the drawings to prove it, thanks to my (laughs) lovely supportive parents. I have a nice little book of my portfolio when I started at about one and a half. And I mean, it was pretty, I was a pretty detailed drawer at that age. I was drawing lips and eyelashes and earrings. And my parents were like, Hmm, this is interesting. And really like right out of the gate, they just nurtured that. And so, um, you know, my Christmas presents and my birthday presents were always trips to the art supply store and I'd get gift certificates. And, you know, I really did nothing else but draw and make art obsessively. I mean, I'm almost 50 and people will ask me, you know, how long have you been an artist? I'm like, "Mm, (laughs) about 49 years, (laughs) but it's true. And, um, I was drawn to illustration. I mean, I just have a love of drawing. So, you know, the big decision for me wasn't so much, um, you know, when it came time to decide where to go to college, it wasn't so much about whether or not I was going to go to art school. That was a done deal. It was whether I was going to do advertising or illustration. And, um, you know, my parents were really always very supportive, but you know, we're like, well, maybe you should look at the business of art, you know, because that's a more viable way to make a living. And like gallery side. Um, I think they were thinking more along the lines of like art director, um, an editor, uh, you know, something, you know, I really didn't focus on electives either in college. It was all art all the time. I went to Columbus college of art and design. And so, and even when I was in high school, everybody kind of knew that, you know, Kate Endel's the artist. This is what she does. My curriculum was created by t- my teachers, and they really cut away a lot of the things that you would normally see in a high school curriculum. I didn't have to go to phys ed for my <laughs> junior and my <laughs> senior year because they put me in an extra class. They took me out of um, a higher level English class and put me in a lower English class. So I would get better grades and get a bigger scholarship. <laughs> I, I didn't have, I stopped taking math in, um, 10th grade. I mean, I look back on it and all that's crazy. Like I absolutely need math. You know, when I'm looking at contracts and trying to figure out percentages on royalties and, you know, proportions, it's, you know, I look back in that and taking me out of an English, like a lower, putting me at a lower level English class. That's like, not cool. Um, but, and I had great art teachers though. So, I mean, ultimately it worked out, but, um, but it's quite a risk at that age to sort of say, we're going to leverage very heavily into the talent that you've got. I mean, it's, I kind of think of it like athletes. If if you screw up your knee in playing football and you never make it to the NFL, you could be screwed. Yeah. And there's a, Another danger in that too, which I realized when I went to art school is um, because I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio, that school is focused on commercial art. So they do have a fine art program, but everybody entering into that school generally knows that they're, you know, going to be making money in the commercial industry, whether it's advertising, illustration, photography, and that school issues a lot of scholarships. So they pull in a very big pool of kids from all different levels and the rock star kids that were a big fish in a little pond really didn't have to try very hard because they already had this incredible talent and you 
you know, I would notice their style as freshmen really didn't evolve very much. And, you know, as they became seniors and were ready to graduate, the kids that came in that didn't really know what the hell they were doing, the growth of those kids was really interesting to watch because they were really open and willing to try all of these different things. But, you know, if you go into art school and you're an airbrush master and you're getting straight A's, you don't really want to like venture out and try a whole lot. I mean, our curriculum at um, CCAD is you have to try everything. Um, But if you're really, really good at something, the chances of you kind of breaking that mold, I think sometimes are, it's almost harder. Yeah, I mean, you you hear a lot of folks talking about how finding a niche and staying within that niche and trying to exploit that niche is the way to make your way in the world today. Um, yeah. You know, whether it's online or whether it's in in a in a discipline, and you hear that a lot. But you 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 also hear stories about athletic kids who got put into baseball and all they did was play baseball and that was it. They find out that those people actually don't excel at quite the same rate as the ones that were allowed to play a variety of different sports and try a lot of different things. And so I'm always curious, like, why wouldn't somebody want to, especially in a creative world, why wouldn't you want to try sculpture? Why wouldn't you want to learn and pull from photography? Those things might inform your core pursuit. Yeah. And you really, as an artist, you're doing yourself such a disservice if you're not trying those different mediums, because you really don't, as a young artist, you really don't know the path that you're going to go down there's as a creative person we're so lucky especially in this day and age because there's so many different platforms and mediums and ways to make art and ways to show your art and sell your art and you don't know if you take a photography class you know when you're 18 years old you don't really know when that photography class is going to show up in your adult life it might not it might So you really do, you know, and this isn't just for young people, it's for older people as well. You really want to like expose yourself to as much as you can. I mean, pre-pandemic, I was taking so many classes and, you know, I don't necessarily need to hone my skills, but I need to be able to communicate and collaborate and be in the same room as other creative people. And I need to, um, you know, just bounce ideas off people and, you know, pick up a different tool and have accidents and, you know, the, the kind of the danger of where I am right now, and I am struggling with this a little bit is that, um, you know, I've been illustrating for 25 years and I work in several different styles, but, um, I think I may have reached like the top of the mountain (laughs) as far as like where I'm going with my style. Um, I know what sells for me and, uh, you know, I can recreate that type of art, um, you know, whether it's like foxes, I can sell a million foxes and I can do a whole bunch of different varieties. I can do them in my sleep at this point. Um, but that's what people want. And so that's what I, and I'd like to make it. And so I will continue to make that until I'm tired of it. And I'm not going to say that I'm tired of making foxes, but there's like a bigger world out there for me. So, um, You know, that's going to be, that's kind of on my list of, and and I am doing it to a certain extent. I take ceramics classes and I'm working with fiber arts. And so, um, you know, I just try not to get too caught up in like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Is this going to sell? That's a little mind trap I can fall into. Yeah. When somebody buys your stuff, you go, oh my God, that's great. I'm going to make more of that. I mean, it's a natural inclination to do that. And yet for a lot of artists, I mean, the idea of doing a lot of different things uh, and challenging yourself is really at the core of it and making those mistakes and and finding those little moments of, oh, wow, I, I actually pulled this thing off. And I think much of the world and certainly much of the art appreciating and art buying public they're buying the piece that's finished, but really what they're investing in is the next piece that the artist is making. And so the artist has to still stay, they have to stay inspired. Hmm. You, you bought you bought my fox, but what am I going to make now? I'm not going to make another fox. If you want to yeah. make another fox, <laughs> I'll, I'll hit print on the, on the computer. I'll, I'll, I'll Xerox it for you. Yeah. So based on the fact that you, you, you're, you're saying that you've made a lot of foxes and you're doing other things, you said you're working with textile, it sounded like, it sounded like you're doing some, some sculpture work. What is this doing for you? inspiration wise? Is this helping generate ideas or are you considering going into some of this as, as a pursuit? Um, that is an interesting question. I've been working in ceramics for about three years and I hadn't 
touched clay since I was about 13 years old. So I really got started with that because I went to Japan with my aunt on a ceramics tour. She's a phenomenal sculptor and painter and she got me hooked into this trip. And I thought, you know, I don't know if I should go on this trip to Japan with you. I don't know these people and it's expensive and I haven't touched clay in 13 years or since I was 13. And she was like, no, you really, you know, you have such a love of Japan. I don't think you can go wrong here. And it blew my mind. I mean, (laughs) I, not only did I go on that trip with her, but I went again five years later with my husband and a couple of our friends. And Once I got back from that trip, I was like, okay, I'm working in clay. And I was doing, I was making a lot of owl things. I was making owl planters and owl plaques. And I make a lot of owl collages. That's like one of my signature animals. So I knew right away I was going to be selling the ceramics. I sell at Pike Place Market in downtown Seattle. And um, I can sell there seven days a week if I want to. But I have to sell there a minimum of two days a week. And so that was a really good, it's been a really good place for me to test art and product. Um, so I knew I was going to sell it right away and they sold, they were selling really well. I don't have my own ceramic studio. So, um, whether or not I'm going to switch gears and be, you know, focus on ceramics that remains to be seen. My husband and I are in the process of building new art studios. So there's a lot of potential for, you know, new ideas that, are coming through there. And then I started to do fiber art about three years ago. I went to a craft conference in Ventura, California called craftcation and that's business classes and it's art classes and craft classes. So I learned how to do punch needle there. And then again, it was like, I have this foundation of selling. I know what sells. So I would just take the collage designs that I was making with cut paper. And I just, took that to a different medium and started doing punch needle. Now punch needle is, I can't get as detailed. It's um, you're using thread and you're threading it through a big needle and you're punching it through fabric. So it almost looks like people often think it's rug hooking. Are you familiar with rug hooking the little strips of, Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can't get super detailed. So there is a big difference in these three different mediums that I'm working in, but I'm always wanting to sell. So it's, I'm motivated by what's going to sell and what I want to make. So do you ever have a hard time reconciling those two things? No, I always want to make money, um, (laughs) because it's so fun. It's so exciting. (laughs) And people are kind of like, uh, you know, roll their eyes. That's kind of crass. But I mean, it's true because what happens is when somebody buys your art, then I can go buy more art supplies and then I can go make more art. And then I can go sell it. And it's, and it's not just like bringing in money. It's um, you're able to connect with somebody. And I've really, really come to appreciate this. I would say in the last five to 10 years, because when I started making money as an artist, I was a freelance illustrator. So I was working from home. I wasn't meeting my clients. Everything was done over the phone, over fax machines. I was buying lists mailing lists and sending out postcards that way. This was before the internet. And then I never thought I would be selling my art face to face. And I switched styles. I went from painter to a collage artist and I was collaging on these canvases and I was getting so, you know, so many of them, I was going to have storage issues. So, um, I started showing my artwork in restaurants and cafes and that was, really great because people were able to sit with the art for an hour, two hours, three hours, you know, look at it, talk about it with their companion. And then they would call me and I would handle the sale. So I really didn't show in galleries very much. Um, I didn't like giving up that 50% to a dealer. And I also didn't like them being kind of in control of how the work was shown or what was going to be shown or Really, that was that was a hustle too. That's a, it's a, it's a lot of work to put your work up in a restaurant and handle the sales. And uh, does the restaurant do anything as an intermediary, or do they just basically say, "Hey, these people want your number. They're interested in this piece. Give them a call." Or for it, that matter, just they don't even fun. they don't even do that. They don't even do that. I mean, I've been selling in restaurants and cafes. I was doing that probably for about fifteen years, and I never had a restaurant call me and say, "Hey, somebody wants to buy your piece," because on the tag on the wall. 
it'll say, if you're interested in this piece of artwork, please call Kate Endel. And they would just call me directly right. or email me. So, um, and then I would go in the restaurant before it opened. I would swap out art. I would meet the person. And so I, you know, I got into this routine of actually like handing somebody my art and saying, thank you. You know, which and, is awfully rewarding, I imagine. Oh my gosh, it's the greatest. And then I transitioned to craft shows, and that was another selling platform. And craft shows really have kind of taken off in the last like 15, let's say 15 years, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, 15, 20 years. So, and then I, about five years ago, six years ago, I signed up for Pike Place Market. And that is the 35th most visited tourist destination on the planet. Yeah, now that's ridiculous. What a crazy claim. I know. This is a, this is a, a large crafting area? <laughs> like, what? I've never been. What is this? Oh, it's spectacular. It's, um, it's a, it started off as a produce market over 100 years ago. And historically, it's very interesting. It's seen a lot of ups and downs. And um, they have had a craft line for I think since the early 70s. So you can buy handmade items. You can buy um, beautiful flower bouquets. They're known for their, um, we have a growing, a lot of flower growers here in the Pacific Northwest. We have a great growing season because we don't have um, winter frost in winter. So the Pike Place Market is famous for the flying fish, which is the fish market where the fishmongers are throwing fish back and forth. And they're known for the flowers. And they're known for this amazing craft line. There's over 200, say 250 vendors that were not all there on the same day, thank goodness. But yeah, it's, it's, you have a booth and it's different every day. It's, you can generally set up in the same area, but it's all based on seniority. And so you're assigned a number and you show up in the morning and your number is called and you pick your spot. You set up from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. And then you break it all down put it in your locker and go home. But it's, I mean, we're getting people from all over the world. Wow. So yeah, it's amazing. So what are your days? Like when, when do you tend to go? Are they, have they been strategically chosen or are they just the days of the week you have less to do? Yeah. I mean, before the pandemic, I was going anywhere from two days a week to five days a week. And during the holiday season, I'll go every, you know, every day for six weeks. My selling season during the holidays is intense. And I also saw with my husband, um, he makes music under the name Casper baby pants and I illustrate his album cover art and I sell my art at his shows along with his albums. And then we write and illustrate children's books together. So in a week before the pandemic, I was doing maybe two Casper shows a week. I was doing two or three days at Pike place market. I was really only working in my studio in the evenings. Maybe I'd have like one full day, but I was able to, you know, wake up in the morning and say, do I want to go to Pike Place Market today? Sure. What's the weather like? What's, you know, what are my needs and how will I get them met? So that's really kind of how my day goes. So, okay. You seem like you've got an endless stream of ideas. You've got different types of art, different types of products, things that have worked, things you've worked on for years. Have you ever had a a, a point in time where you're, you're done? You've got nothing left. There's nothing in the tank. Um, I sort of hit a wall two months into the pandemic and when the pandemic really, we knew we were in trouble was probably early March. We, we got it a little bit earlier than the rest of the States because we're the COVID cases were really starting to get higher and higher because of the, um, we had a retirement community. So that was early March. We, I, my last day at Pike Place Market, I think was like March 6th. And Chris and I thought, okay, we're just going to hunker down for the next couple months and just focus on projects that we haven't had a chance to work on. So we went crazy. We were just working from the minute we woke up to the minute we went to bed. And it was great because we had these, un, we had this unlimited amount of time, but we also had this like hovering cloud of doom over us. Like, where is this going to go? And, you know, we thought maybe it was going to go, you know, bloom in the summer and kind of wrap up at the end of the summer. So two months go by and I just, I really did run out of gas. I was tired. I was, I think I was burned out. I don't ever really want to stop making art. I don't ever really want to stop working. And I think that the pandemic has told me like, you need to stop. And also the Black Lives Matter movement was happening in May, 
around this time. And it just, you know, with the political situation, I was just completely like sucked dry of any sort of joy or motivation or, and that lasted for about three months. So, you know, with my husband and I both doing sort of similar uh, creative endeavors, we always would look at each other and say, who's going to run out of gas first? And then what's going to happen? Because the nice thing about our union is that we are so absorbed into our creativity that there isn't somebody saying, Hey, what about me? Like, when are you going to pay attention to me? Like, when are we going to go for a walk? When are we going on a date? We, you know, we just don't do that with one another, but we also work from home. So we are able to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And, but you know, we kind of just, he didn't work very much either last summer. So we were able to kind of run out of gas at the same time. And it's, uh, you know, I'm still trying to manage it. Honestly, it's, uh, I'm definitely in a better place than I was last year, but I work better with deadlines and a long to-do list. If I wake up in the morning and I don't really know what my plan is, that's a problem. Yeah. It can be incredibly hard. I think for a lot of creative folks, but just people in general, I mean, if you don't have a place to be, if you don't have a, a bus to catch, it can be hard to get your motor running. And it's all yeah. the more difficult, I think, with people who are trying to generate work and ideas. And it's it's incredibly hard to devote that extra energy that's required to do that when there's such a deficit of positive energy and something nice to look forward to. I mean, it was nice to sort of have Instagram and have Facebook and see people. There were some people that were just on fire. And, you know, that will be the silver lining. One of the silver linings of this pandemic is that people had time to grow ideas and they had time to, you know, spend with their family and, and, you know, replenish their soul and their, you know, I had a lot of heal, physical healing to do. My shoulder was out of whack. My back was really out of whack. You know, I had a, like a whole laundry list of health things that I just was not really taking care of because I was so into selling and being out. And, you know, I really love doing that. So, um, I needed to stop and that was helpful. What do you what do you think is going to make a difference? I mean, have you started to kind of work your way back into being creative, into feeling a bit better? Have you found some some part of the internet that's made you feel a bit better and and maybe helped you connect with some of your buyers and some of your people over this time? Yeah, I'm paying a little bit more attention to blogs and podcasts and just hearing what people are doing and how they're handling their time and I have started to listen to audiobooks and you know the last 4 years with the Trump administration I could not tear myself away from the news and that was so bad for me I just felt like I had to be on top of it because I had to be ready to go if I need if we needed to go like literally if we needed to pack the car and we needed to like flee for some reason it was really like that kind of feeling. And so now that we have a different administration, it's not so much that, I mean, there's always that kind of threat wherever you live. I mean, whether it's an earthquake, a natural disaster, whatever, but it was, um, it was just like sucking the life out of me. And so now that I've pulled away from the news and I've immersed myself into audiobooks, I can free up some, some of that space and let things grow a little bit more. And, um, I mean, really what I should be doing is just sitting and just staring out the window. And, you know, I did a lot of that last summer and it was really, really helpful. And I just thought to myself, you know, this is such a gift. And, you know, I was talking to a lot of my artist friends, you know, and they were saying, oh my gosh, this is the first time I've ever like seen a baby squirrel, like the full like life cycle of a squirrel being born. And then it's like growing up and, oh my gosh, I was able to see, you know, the daffodils bloom and die. And I mean, people really like focused in on home and nature and you know, it was cool. So, um, you know, get, being in my studio and just quieting that really horrific noise is really... <laughs> I mean, duh, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel similarly. I've been, I've been recently, I've taken up walking, which sounds ridiculous since I've been walking my entire life, but I put on shoes in the dead of winter in Toronto, where we definitely have had some winter and I go walking and it's just kind of, you know, an excellent break. Yeah. It's, it's quite meditative, 
because it's something different. It's something new. It's something uh, I would not normally have done. And it's quite uh, reinvigorating when you're depleted. Well, that's, you know, another silver lining of the pandemic is people are realizing, hey, I do like to cook or, you know, I do love walking. It's, you know, we're all kind of resetting our priorities and, um, you know, that's nice. Yeah, I think it's. I think that's definitely one of the nice takeaways from all of this. I mean, as we literally, I think as as of right now, we're what about two to three weeks out from uh, our our one year COVID anniversary. I think it was yeah. basically the thirteenth of March is when uh, my kids' daycare got shut down, and here we are a year later. I mean, it's been it's been rough on everybody, and you know, you speak to a lot of artists, and everybody's feeling it in different ways, and everybody's been trying to cope with it in different ways. But I think the extra difficulty for creative people is, is that it's become exponentially more difficult to make stuff, to yeah. actually have the energy and have generate the output or for that matter to sell what you make, to get rid of it. I know a lot of people that are, that are sitting in houses full of their work. Yeah. Sound familiar? I, I mean, that's, yeah, it's been like a little bit stressful. I mean, it's funny because I have all the supplies, right? I, at the beginning of last year, I ordered all my canvases, all my backing boards, blah, 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 all the stuff. So the stuff is always in the cabinet. Um, and as I'm making the art, I'm just transferring it from the cabinet into my bins, which I will eventually take to like place market to sell. But I'm panicking because I'm making the art faster than I can sell it. And I don't really understand why I'm panicking. It's still taking up the same amount of space in my house. It's just, I'm just moving it from one place to another place. It's, you know, but it's, you know, I just wonder like that first day at Pike Place Market, you know, what am I going to sell? Like, how am I going to shoot? What's the display going to be like? And am I going to bring all 15 bins of artwork? I think that's what you have. But I normally have one. Yeah, I know. It'll all sell. I'm definitely not worried that it won't sell. And, you know, my internet sales have been like through the roof. Thank goodness. I redid my website two years ago and that was, thank goodness I did that. Well, what did you do to it that, that has made such a difference or had you prepared, I guess, for, for something like this? Well, I had an Etsy shop. I've been on Etsy for 2000, since 2007. So I was there in the early days and it was a great platform, but it's really, um, it's a third, third party seller, right? So you are at the mercy of that third party, whether it's Etsy or, um, you know, if you're running your business off Facebook or you're running it off Instagram, those platforms can get yanked out from under you fast. And I had heard somebody talk about that at Craftcation at that craft conference that I had mentioned earlier. And that just like scared the hell out of me. And it's one of the reasons why I do not put all my eggs in the Etsy basket. I don't put all my eggs in the Pike Place Market basket. I'm always trying to find different selling platforms because if one falls through and that's your only gig, you're screwed. So um, Diversify your portfolio, people. Yeah, definitely. So I opened up a Shopify site. I hired a branding team. I had just sold my condo. I was sitting on a chunk of cash and I was like, you know what? I really have not put a lot of money or thought into my brand. And what do I want that to look like? And so I hired this branding company and it was um, A. Lydia and they were amazing. And they put together my Shopify site for me and they redid all my, um, I do, I have promotional cards and business cards and they changed my business name and they, you know, it was, it was a, it was a big deal. It was terrifying too, because it was a lot of money. I'd never put so much money into something like that before. I think when all was said and done, I spent around 20 grand, which is like, I mean, I, I was like for three months, I could not sleep because that I just really couldn't like wrap my brain around that. Um, and you do not need to spend that kind of money on a website. Absolutely. You do not need to do that. And not only do you not need to do that, but, um, you know, you can do that on your own, but here's the thing. Like I do so many things I don't need to do everything. I don't need to build my website. I don't need to be cutting my boards down. I can like farm the stuff out. I don't need to be doing my taxes. I can have an accountant. And so that's something that I have to remind remind myself every day is that I don't have to, you know, know everything. And obviously you can't do your taxes. You you, you don't know how to do math. Yeah, because I stopped (laughs) math in high school. (laughs) 
I think most people did, to be fair. But no, but I mean, that's exactly the point is, is that there are professionals out there in these different fields. And you may find that you get to a point where you, you, you require professional level help. You can do lots of things, but but why? What are you going to, you're going to take yourself away from the thing you're good at in order to fumble your way through and probably screw up this other thing. Yeah. And then you're going to have to pay somebody to fix it anyhow. Yeah. I mean, if you wind up being aware enough, which it sounds like you are, you know, you, you hired some folks to give you some good advice in an area that you lacked that type of confidence. Yeah. I mean, I will say over the years, the one thing that I've really learned is that what I really need to be doing is going towards the thing that terrifies me. So, you know, that website build out and brand rebuild was one of the scariest things I've ever done. And it paid for itself, like not right away. I mean, it took about a year, but had I not done all that, especially during the pandemic, I I would have been out thousands and thousands of dollars because I would not have had the structure to support the kind of sales that I've been doing lately. So, you know, going to Japan with my aunt, I mean, I had no business going on. I mean, that was an, that was a five-star trip. That was so expensive. I think I ended up spending like $12,000 on that trip. I extended it. It was a two week ceramic tour and I extended it for a month, but I was like, I have no business going on a trip. That's this expensive. But what it did was it ignited my interest in ceramics. And so then I started taking ceramics classes and I started selling ceramics and you know, it's, it all, it, you're investing in yourself and it's hard for me to, um, well, it's easier now, but you know, when I was in my early thirties to spend money on my business or to spend money nurturing my creativity was like, I was terrified of that. So, you know, that terror that you run towards, you know, of course you're not going to run towards a bear, but the reason why you're, it's scaring you is because it, re, it's, re, there's something that's resonating within you if it didn't scare you, it might be because there is nothing there for you to learn. So, and and it's a hard lesson. I really have to remind myself that every day, like I really, you know, I'm terrified of Photoshop and Illustrator because I don't want to become dependent on those tools because if those tools crash and I can't get a project done, I don't want to be stuck, but it's resonating with me. You know, it's scaring me. It's, um, so it's that's probably something I should tackle next, but it's not as fun as making art. So <laughs> traditionally, and I, and I think that you're you're the type of person, and you know you're at the point in your career you, you've had a pre-internet existence and a pre-internet career, and a very much a, obviously now a post-internet or a, you know a current. And and the thing is, is things have changed dramatically. I mean, you can't just go and sell at restaurants the rest of your life and you can't just go and sell necessarily at the market the rest of your life though some people have made good hay that way but there's a big big world out there who would be interested in your stuff and if you're not going to employ new tools you're, you're going to be leaving uh, whether it's money on the table or for that matter you might get sort of feel like you're left behind a little bit i mean at a certain point it's very hard to catch up right yeah well and if you you know for me to go digital I, i've never created art digitally i have to keep up with the technology and I'm just not interested in doing that. So whether or not I want to go that route, I mean, it, I'll know when it's time for me to jump ship, but I honestly, like, why would that happen? Why would I, what world would exist where I can't, I shouldn't be making art traditionally. I don't know. But then again, you know, with the pandemic, I thought I was really ahead of it by creating all these income streams. And I was, I mean, I, you know, I have been able to support myself through the pandemic because I have these multiple streams, but I didn't realize that, you know, I mean, every single one of them has been affected publishing, selling face to face, you know, the whole thing has just been altered. It'll come back. You know, I, I'm not afraid that it won't come back. It'll be different, but you know, it's getting, it's making me think that, you know, maybe I need to start looking at my freelance career because when I started selling at craft shows and I started selling with Casper baby pants and at Pike place market, I really became addicted to that like one and done sale where it was like, I just made this art and you're giving me money and I put it in a bag and you walk away. I don't have to deal with a contract. I don't have to deal with royalties. I don't really have to worry about copyright infringement. And so I let the freelance kind of fall away a little bit. Um, I was getting kind of burned out on that too, but, um, you know, for the last six years, I've been so focused on selling face to face that, you know, maybe it is time to 
start pursuing more freelance clients. So there's an ebb and flow to all of this and it's, you just have to get used to it. Um, the inconsistency, you have to get used to that. You were saying that you, you have a good time or you've had a good time over COVID finding people on Facebook and Instagram, but I mean, business wise, are those useful tools to you or are they just a huge pain in the ass? Are they something you just kind of reluctantly deal with? Or is that really a place where you're connecting with people? No, it's huge. It's, I get a lot of sales from Facebook and Instagram. I don't work it like a lot of other people do. I don't buy ads and I just post stuff. Um, I think if you're going to get into the Facebook game with ads, that's, you got to know what you're doing. You have to know what your, who your target audience is and it's a long game and I'm totally not interested in that. And that goes right along with Photoshop and learning Adobe Illustrator is you have to stay up and stay up with the times because they're constantly changing and you know, the algorithm and, and the layouts and the interface and, Oh my gosh, SEO is changing. And I'm just not interested in that. I belong to a group of women called the lady makers and they're local women that live locally here in the Pacific Northwest. And we all do different things. Um, everything from like handbags to, you know, there's a jeweler, there's a woman that does greeting cards. And so we talk once a week before the pandemic, we were meeting once a month. And so we exchange ideas and we, we talk about social media and what works for people. And so I have a really good sounding board. You know, if I, if I do get stuck on something as far as like just recently, I was not able to connect products in my shop to Instagram and Facebook because Facebook had like changed something up. So I was able to go to them and be like, what the hell's going on now? So, um, you know, the answers are all there on the internet. I'm just not interested. (laughs) You know, I have to have my hand held a lot with these things. And again, it's like, I go back to like, I don't need to know every single thing. (laughs) Yeah. I find there's obviously there's a ton of information online. YouTube, for example, is everybody's go-to for, for how to's and yeah, you can find lots of stuff, but you can also find a lot of crap. I mean, you can get buried in it and it can take, I just lose a day trying to figure out one simple answer. And instead you wind up with hopefully that answer, but probably seven or eight other questions along the way. So, you know, and and there's always somebody with a new tip or trick that you absolutely just have to do or else you're going to, you know, your website's going to explode. It's quite endless, but I guess this is the world we have to play in at times. Yeah. I love the internet. I mean, I really try and focus on the great aspects of it. I mean, you know, people complain about Facebook and Instagram and I'm like, it's free. It's a free, I mean, I say free and there's air quotes, you know, I mean, we're all selling our soul. (laughs) Yeah. We're all selling our soul, uh, a little bit, but I'm cool with that because I think it just does. So it's such a great way for people to connect. Um, you know, people will reach out and they'll say, well, what kind of glue are you using or what, you know, they'll ask me supply questions and I love answering stuff like that. And I, I don't know. I just love seeing how many people are being creative. I mean, it's incredible. And I I think it's really motivated and inspired a lot of people and, you know, Kickstarter and fundraisers and, you know, people are able to like create these incredible projects that they wouldn't have been able to do without the internet. So, you know, it's like anything else, there's good and bad to it. Tell me about Pinterest. You're the only person I've spoken to that seems to have an active presence on Pinterest and like actual followers. <laughs> I I I, don't, I barely even understand <laughs> Pinterest. It's just basically a bunch of things stuck to a wall. And I look at it and I go, okay, I don't get it. How are you using this platform? What's it doing for you? I don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> that's funny that you asked me that because I when I first signed up for Pinterest, I loved it and I was obsessed with it. And I just, I am a collector. So I've collected everything from like sticker books to Japanese folk art and it goes on and on and on. So it really like the sticker book collector, like putting the stickers on the page, like it really brought me back to those days as a kid. And so, I don't know, I was just creating these boards and I didn't really think anything of it other than I'm creating these fun little pages. I don't really know what I'm doing with it. I actually kind of started, uh, I wasn't really paying attention to it. And then I met with my web designer to go over a few things and we were talking about it. And she's like, you really need to switch it over to a business account. And, you know, with your boards, you need to make the things that you're collecting, whether it's like, 
you know, I have a board that's all vintage roller skating, or I have a board that's Inuit art, like shut all that down, make that secret, and then keep your art boards available for the public because you won't water your brand down so much. A little more carefully curated. Yeah. And she, I mean, I just had that meeting with her last week. So I'm still trying to digest that and understand really what that means. I don't know if I'm getting any sales off of it. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't, honestly, I don't know. And it's one of those things where it's like, I probably should understand what I'm doing a little bit more before I'm just like throwing stuff out there. But, um, I do love it. I, I love the aesthetic of it. It's just, um, I love the images that are out there. It's really cool. I love, I could just like spend all day looking at different ways to draw an eyeball. Well, I mean, even just looking at your, your page and your boards, I mean, it's a great place for your work to shine. It's so visual and your stuff pops off the screen. I mean, it's, it's fun animals and hilarious sayings and it doesn't seem to get lost in the shuffle. Like it might a little bit more with the algorithm driven Twitter and Facebook and stuff with, you know, every different type of content. This is so visual. So it, it, it's not surprising to me that you've had a lot of people drawn to it, but I'm fascinated by the fact that you were told to maybe kind of pull away from some of the personal stuff simply because so many of these platforms seem to thrive off of telling personal stories, sharing things that aren't work. You know, you kind of always get slapped for promoting yourself too much. Do you ever run into that? Um, no, I don't think anyone's ever told me that I'm doing it too much. I might be doing it too much, but I don't care. It's my business. I'm going to run it the way that I want to run it. And if you don't like what I'm putting up, then like, go away. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I don't understand that, you know, my whole attitude about social media is I'm going to do it for me. And if you want to join me, that's cool. I would love to have you. And I don't get really political on my pages. I do. I was getting a little bit more political on Facebook. I have a Facebook personal page and a Facebook illustration page, but, and I, you know, I talk about this with my lady maker friends too, when like black lives matter was happening and still happening and the me too movement and you know, how much of your political opinion do you want to mix in with your art? And on my Instagram page, my business Instagram page, I didn't really want to put stuff about how much I hated Trump. It was just like, I didn't really need to do that. So many people were doing it. Doesn't jive with my brand and kids come onto my page to get inspiration. So I didn't want all this vitriol and all this like scary stuff there. I just decided to keep that on Facebook. But then you also want to highlight you know, things that are going on, like with the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, maybe what I want to do is start highlighting Black authors and illustrators because I'm an illustrator. So, you know, people of color have been really like underrepresented in children's books for a long time. It's definitely getting better, but there's, there's ways to do it. I've just been trying to figure out how to make it work for me. Like a lot of my friends were like, I don't care what people say. If somebody doesn't like what I've posted about black lives matter, then they can just like go away. And I totally understand that and support that. And, um, I just want to make it. So it's, um, I also don't want to make it like, I don't want it to be a fad. I don't want you to see all this black lives matter stuff on my page from 2020 and now it's 2021. And you know, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. So I, I, when I'm posting stuff, I'm trying to create like a good balance of things and it's hard, you know, just because you don't see something on someone's page doesn't mean that they don't care. You know, if you, if you don't post fundraising stuff for earthquake victims, does that mean you don't care about those earthquake victims or, yes. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it's that that is something that I struggle with because I do want to use it for good, but I also want it to make sense. Well, and I think that's the difference for a lot of people having a personal and a business page. The business can be business and can stay on brand and personal. You decide what you're going to post and what you're going to put out there. Yeah. It's hard too when you're an artist because so much of your business is what's personal. So how do you, how do you do that? I don't know. I ask myself that a lot. Well, there's a big separation between, I mean, you're an adult and you make stuff, generally speaking, for kids or certainly for kids to enjoy. And, you know, I, I think 
a lot of people there, maybe the art they're making and who they're making it for are a lot closer, let's say in age and perhaps in perspective as well. So maybe they, maybe yeah. they don't separate it so much. And maybe your option is to separate it a little bit more just simply because your audience is more separate. Yeah. Yeah. I've enjoyed kind of seeing how people work their political views into their art. There's an illustrator, Lisa Congdon, who does that really, really well. She's got a very powerful voice and she's great at hand lettering. And so she's able to do these inspirational quotes and these social justice quotes and these images that she just like, she's a really good person to look at as far as like the whole package socially responsible, a fantastic designer. I don't know her personally. I, I do know people that know her and love her and I can't think she's anything but wonderful, but um, it's, I really enjoyed kind of going through social media and finding those artists who can really marry those two things. Well, it's really hard to do. Well, speaking of other artists, what kind of advice might you have for somebody who wants to get into the illustration game? Well, the really, really nice thing about it is you don't have to put a lot of time or money into it up front. You can just start by doodling in a sketchbook and posting that online and seeing what sort of reaction you get to it. And don't worry if you don't get very much reaction to it because you might not. That doesn't really mean anything. But you know, you really want to spend the time honing your craft, trying a lot of different things, putting it out there on social media, you know, get some business cards printed up and go put them on a bulletin board in your grocery store or get a promotional postcard and, you know, leave it on a table at a restaurant. Or, I mean, I do all sorts of like weird, funny things. We've got like little free libraries. Do you guys, I'm sure you have those in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, If I have a damaged book, uh, the book that I've illustrated that I don't want to sell, I'll put it in one of those little lending libraries and put my business card in there with a coupon for free shipping. I mean, I'll, I'll put my stuff anywhere. Um, where I think somebody might pick it up and just don't be afraid to try things. And, you know, you'll be surprised at how things pay off. I mean, I have people who they picked up my business card at a restaurant 10 years ago, they put it in their purse and then they didn't use that purse for like three years and they pulled the purse out and they saw my card and they were like, Oh, I remember I really liked your card. And they'll buy something from me online and they'll say, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I just found your business card from three years ago. I mean, that's just like amazing to me. So, and then this is another thing that I have to remind myself, you know, if you put yourself out there and you're not getting something, you're not getting a response immediately. Do not freak out about that because that doesn't mean that people aren't paying attention or they're not interested. It's just really all about timing. Uh, That is one of the tricky things about social media is if I put a post up and I'm paying attention to the likes and it's not getting as many likes as I want it to, that doesn't look really mean anything because the, I don't know what's going on with the algorithm. I don't know. Like it's a false sense of approval. Like there's a, you know, when you want to sell your art for a living, you're doing this dance of being really secure in yourself and your talent and getting approval from others. And it's hard to go through life when you're trying to make other people happy and you're basing your self-worth on other people's approval but you also kind of need it too, because you, you want to, I mean, at least I do. I want to make things that people want to buy. And it's not because I want to make money. It's because I want to generate a feeling in their stomach and their heart that feels explosive. And like, I want to like people to get chills, like when they see my art, it's not about making money and you know, the ego stroke it's, um, but you also want to pay attention to it. See, I'm like going back and forth. I'm like, you want to pay attention to it, but you don't want to pay attention to it. So just, you know, try and really go with your gut. I mean, I really have like learned to follow my gut and find out what I'm scared of and um, follow that. And, uh, you know, you're just, it's it's just a never ceases to amaze me what has come down the path for me and I'm a late bloomer. So, you know, despite the fact that I've been doing this for 50 years, it's, you know, I'm not a rock star illustrator. I never have been. It's taken me a long time to support myself doing this. I've had a lot of part-time jobs. 
um, for people that are starting out, they will have to have part-time jobs and don't poo poo that either because I was, have you ever seen the movie shop girl with Claire Danes where she's leaning on the counter and she's just like dreaming of another life. I mean, that was me at my art supply store job. I worked in an art supply store for 10 years and I would lean on that counter and I would be like, I should not be here. And you know what? I love that job. I learned so much. I got so many freelance jobs from it. And when they went out of business, my world was, you know, shattered. And to this day, there are jobs that I work on. There's art that I make where I think of Seattle Art Supply and how grateful I was for that job. And so you may be doing something that you don't want to do, but what you don't know is how it's going to influence your art and your creativity down the road. So just like enjoy it, like enjoy the fact that you're making coffee for somebody or that you're ringing up their groceries or that you're delivering food to them. There's like so much joy in that and it's waiting for you to discover it. And if you open yourself up to the joy of all the mundane things, you're going to be shocked at how much room you have allowed for the creativity dump. I like really think that creative people are so, I mean, every single person on the planet is, has the ability to tie into the energy of the universe. And when you do that, you're going to start noticing really how incredible things are. It's, it's like a gratitude journal. You know, you, if you start writing down the things that you're grateful for, whether it's a fresh cup of orange juice, a sharpened pencil or comfortable shoes, you're then going to be on this path where you want to start discovering fun little things. And then when you start doing that, you've rewired your brain and then you're like off and running. So, I mean, that's a really long winded (laughs) answer, but it's important because it's, you can get really, there's a lot of anxiety wrapped up in this gig. So just try not to get too wound up in that. Kate, where can people find out more about you? Uh, I am online at my website at kateendle.com. And you can view my portfolios and you can shop around there. And then I'm also on Instagram at Kate Endel Illustration. And I'm on Facebook at Kate Endel Illustration and Fine Art. And where else am I? I guess I'm on Pinterest again. Absolutely. (laughs) Just Google Kate Endel. And then, you know, if you ever make it to Seattle, always go to Pike Place Market. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. Thanks for asking. It was fun. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.